We're very excited to introduce our next panel member, Julie Brown, the current CFO and COO um, of Burberry, uh, the listed FTSE 100. Uh, it's one of the world's leading global luxury brands. And by way of exe her executive career, Julie qualified at KPMG before joining ICI and then AstraZeneca, initially in a variety of finance roles before broadening in strategy and marketing. Her next big adventure, took her to Latin America, where she was the regional vice president. And in 2013, Julie was headhunted by Smith & Nephew, another FTSE 100 medical devices company in her first CFO role before moving to Burberry, where she is currently the CFO and COO. In addition to her rather stellar executive career, Julie joined the board of Roche, the Swiss headquartered and listed multinational healthcare company. She is also an advisor to the Mayor of London on the board, and she has sat on other boards, including the UK National Health Service. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Nice to meet you. The subject of today's conversation is to get some insight into taking on your first non-executive director role and your experience of doing that alongside a very busy executive career. So perhaps if I could take you back to your thought process, Julie, when you were considering taking on your first non-exec, um, I'd like to ask, what was your thinking on the timing of taking on your first listed company non-executive directorship? When we look at things like capacity and other considerations around sector, size, scale, importantly, the year end, which I know is important, and in particular, your thoughts about chairing the audit committee versus joining the board without any chair responsibilities. Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of the timing, it was um, it was really determined in conjunction with my CEO, because uh, he said, you know, the first two years with Smith and Nephew, this was focus on the exec career. And yeah. then two years later, you know, he was perfectly open to me doing a non-exec opportunity. And he had a number of caveats, but one caveat was it has to be large. <laughs> and uh, the reason he said that, I think, was because you can, if you're an exec, you can only take one. And um, he wanted it to be large and significant so that you were using the single slot in a very productive way. Yeah. And um, literally the following day, I got a call from... Uh, uh, a headhunter, I won't mention the name, but I got no, a, call from, <laughs> a call from a headhunter <laughs> about the Roche opportunity. And of course, that qualified as large uh, on, a, on a very considerable scale. So um, Olivia was fully on board with me doing it. And um, the opportunity was to be the audit chair. So it wasn't to be, you know, a normal board member, it was to be the audit chair. And I did think about it long and hard for the reason you said because both companies did have uh, the same year end as well, 31st of December. Yeah. But the Roche reporting calendar was a week ahead of the Smith & Nephew one, so it was possible to do, to do both. Having said this, there are certain times of the year in both Smith & Nephew and Burberry where I have no time whatsoever, not even the weekend, because it is just completely full on when, when those two calendars uh, coincide. I, I really... Um, it was daunting at the first because of the scale of Roche and also going in as the audit chair, but actually it's been hugely beneficial and I'd recommend it to anyone because you get the benefit of seeing another organization. You get a, a broader view by seeing another company, particularly if yes. it's a large, a large scale company. And, um, you know, Roche are at the forefront of science. So in the pandemic, it was extremely helpful information that I could then use in my executive life also in Burberry in terms of the way the pandemic was likely to pan out. Um, and I think I just really enjoy the experience. I enjoy working with the people I work with on the Roche board because they are absolutely phenomenal people. And I would say to people, as long as you can make the calendars work, I would go for it. You've got a real advantage if you're already a sitting CFO because you know the regulations, you keep up to date anyway, because it's part of your day job. And in my case, because I'd um, worked in pharmaceuticals for 25 years, it was an industry that I knew, I knew well and could hopefully add value to Rush. I think you've answered in part um, why you chose Rush. Why do you think they chose you? 
I think I think I was lucky um, in the sense that they had uh, they got uh, the headhunter was doing the search, and I think they drawn the line at FTSE forty, so FTSE forty and above. It yeah. was an it was an international search, um, so they were looking at US uh, US uh, counterparts as well, and and Smith and Nephew had just made it into FTSE forty. So I think I just made I just made the <laughs> just made bar. I just made the bar. Otherwise, I would have been below the the, the water level. And um, they were specifically looking for um, farmer expertise because the changes in the board meant they were specifically looking for that. Yeah. Somebody who was deep seated in farmer. And they were also specifically looking for an audit committee chair. So of course the finance background was um, was essential. So yes, I think I was, uh, it was It was very, very fortunate that it was that week that I'd had a conversation with my CEO as well. So all the stars aligned. How important was the social purpose aspect of your choice of board, particularly given your involvement with the NHS and the Prince's Trust? Well, I think when personal purpose and company purpose connect, it's magical. And you then have a North Star to guide the work that you do. So I think being a purpose driven business and really staying true to the values that you um, believe in, um, it just makes everything so much easier. And, th and that really resonates with me. So in the case of Roche, of course, their mission is to solve some of the world's most serious diseases where there's significant unmet medical need. And, that includes oncology, they major in oncology, but also Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis. And that really resonated with me and, and always has, in fact, from, from the age of 18. Obviously, my father died when I was very young. So it meant a lot for me to work for a purpose driven organization. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. And it seems to be a key driver for many people looking at non-execs at the moment. Julie, who did you seek guidance from um, to help you make the transition that you've made um, when one thinks about sponsors, men mentors, the external guidance and the internal guidance that you were given? I think um, a number of key people, really. I, I spoke to, when I was contemplating Rush, um, obviously my CEO, who supported me doing it, my current audit chair, because he was experienced at being an audit chair. And then I also um, spoke to the, the audit chair that was leaving Roche, Dame Dion Julius, extensively about the role and you know, what the role involved, et cetera. And then I also had a mentor who was my previous CFO boss in AstraZeneca uh, John Simons, who's now chair yeah. of Glaxo, and yeah. he was he was also instrumental in supporting me and sort of navigating that period of introduction. I mean, one of the things again, I was fortunate to be able to do was I shadowed Dame Dion Julius for eight months before taking over as the audit chair, and that was extremely helpful, just because you get a very good sense of the culture of an organisation, and before you take on the sort of leadership of the committee. Yeah. You're aware of the personalities, you're aware of the yeah. major issues and the culture. Oh, interesting. And did the, did the size and the scale of the business, was that in any way intimidating as your, your first non-executive director, particularly given that it's, it's an international business, it's listed abroad? Yes, initially, for sure. Um, yeah, the Roche, the Roche board members... Uh, have had amazing backgrounds and and the scale of Roche definitely um, it's a, a very significant organization about 250 billion market cap yeah so so yes it it was I think the um the thing that probably helped helped in my situation was the fact that it was um it was healthcare and I'd been in AstraZeneca for 25 years so I I felt I knew it because I'd studied it so much as a competitor, actually, when I was in AZ. Um, I knew some of the people in Russia already, because the farmer industry is fairly close knit. And um, when it came to taking on the role, um, I also did something that was very helpful and I would certainly advise people to do. There is um, a Deloitte audit committee self-evaluation tool. 
And I actually used that quite early on to understand whether we were set up for success. And it also enabled me to have quite deep conversations with the chairman, the CEO, the CFO, together with my fellow audit committee members. So early on, you could try to trait what you were doing according to the needs of you know, the major people that you were working with. What did you do just on that on that basis to, to get to know the business? And, and how have you gone about building your relationship with the CFO, which is clearly a, a principal relationship for you? Yes, it, it certainly is. I think uh, in terms of getting to know the business, so I was able to look at a lot of history about the company in terms of its inception and the um, areas that, you know, the medicines that it had developed. Um, there are industry publications which are extremely helpful. Um, you know, First Word Pharma, which I was still subscribing to since I was in AZ. And, and I think the strategy plan and the financial plan is also a key enabler to understanding the direction the company's going in and what's important and the major dis strategic decisions the company's taking. So Roche, for one, for example, was not going to go into biosimilars. It was only going to pursue innovative new medicines. So that was quite an important uh, turning point, I think, for Roche as well. The, um, the risk assessment. As an audit chair lead, you've got to really be looking at the risks the business is associated with and the mitigation, the key mitigation. In terms of key relationships, um, there, are, there are actually a number of key relationships in, in addition to the CFO, I'll come back to the CFO in a second, but the chairman is a key relationship, the CEO is a key relationship, I had a number of meetings and lunches with the CEO. Um, that, was prior, that was prior to you getting into both, both, yeah. uh, both subsequently um, and beforehand. And then also, I think the head of an internal audit, and if they also cover risk assessment, the head of risk. So these are really important relationships together with the external auditor. In terms of the CFO relationship, um, a lot of that is based on trust, I think, because as a non-exec, you never have the insight into a company that you have as an exec, because as an exec, you have steeped in the company and what's going on. So I think you've got to build really strong relationships with the people we just mentioned and a great deal of trust in, in the CFO and all the major accounting decisions that are, that are being made. One of, the thing, one of the things that we do, which um, I think is really, really helpful is we have what's called a lab um, in the month before the reporting, the major reporting period ends. So we have this lab to understand what the major judgments are that are taking place in either the half year or the year that you're reporting, because then you go into that in December, say you're reporting at the end of January, mm -hmm. you've got a good sense of where that's going to lead to already yes. in December. So you can, you can have a good dialogue about the major areas beforehand. Fascinating, really interesting. Um, Julie, uh, perhaps a, a slightly personal question, but what have you learned most about yourself since joining an external board? And how does that differ from what you've learned through your executive career? I think the key difference and, and what, you, what you learn is um, as a non-executive, you, you're not there to run the business. <laughs> you are there to be, you've got a governance role and you've got an advisory role. And the most important thing is that you can influence a situation. Um, and I think that teaches you a lot about yourself in terms of how you cope with uncertainty, mm -hmm. how you cope with not having all the facts or the information, yes. um, how you cope with influencing stakeholders along the journey, and very importantly, listening. Listening skills are probably even more important in a non-exec role and having that understanding of what's going on beneath the surface. If there is anything going on beneath the surface, you need to have, I guess, the antennae to be able to pick that up. Um, so, yeah, I think all, all those skills are really important and you learn a lot through doing it. What has surprised you most about being a non-exec? I guess it's the, it's, it's the fact that you, you are there sort of at a distance to be, to be independent. 
So I, I guess most of my career, I've been used to working on projects and in teams where you are a key person around the table delivering the project. Yeah. And in the case of the non-exec, what you learn is that that's not the role. Uh, the role is there to support, to advise, to challenge when you need to, and be prepared to do that. And don't even hesitate if you feel you need to do that. So it, it is a different skill set. I mean, it's part of, I think, the armory that you build when you're developing a career anyway. And a CFO role is, it lends itself to it because you have to do a lot through influence anyway as a CFO. So actually doing, you know, influencing in a non-exec position is, is actually quite a similar skill set. Very interesting. And one of the great challenges, I think, for executives, whether they're CFOs or CEOs or in other executive roles, is really balancing the responsibilities and the requirements of being a non-exec and that of being an executive. How do you do that as well as being a, a working mum? It can be a challenge. It can, it can <laughs> definitely be a challenge. Um, I mean, first of all, before taking it on, I did talk to my family and you know, said that it means mum will be away. And in this case, I guess we're going to be away in Switzerland as well. So mum will be away even more than I was before. And yeah. so the family, I mean, the family also, I mean, my husband's, you know, PhD scientist, so he loves Roche. So he was like, <laughs> you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Yeah. Um, and my kids just think, because I've worked in pharma all my life as well, they they also kind of been brought up in the pharma world. So they were actually really supportive and that was important at the, the outset to get everybody on board with it. And then in terms of balance, I think it is really difficult. There are certain times of the year where my balance goes right, the scales go right down, it's true. But I think... What I try to do is make up for it at other times of the year. And I also am a great believer in health and fitness. So, you know, I do do a lot of cycling and try and keep myself fit and then just accept for a couple of weekends every quarter um, that we'll have to just go by the wayside temporarily. And then I, I step it up again afterwards. Great, great advice. How has your perspective on finance changed since being a, a non-exec and, um, and what do you see as the, the key themes that finance functions will need to address in a post-COVID world? I th yeah, I think there are a number of things with this. Um, I think the first thing is all about dynamic resource allocation. I think the companies who've been successful through this have been very agile and you know, you go through a period, you know, we've worked without budgets, for example, because the world was too uncertain to really have a budget. So we developed, we ran the business, um, this was in, in Burberry actually, rather than the non-exec role, but we ran the business using scenarios and for inventory purchases, because we wanted to be ready for a rebound, we planned to an upside scenario. For the cost base, we planned to a base case. And then for liquidity purposes and financing, we plan to a downside case. So it's a lot more dynamic than it used to be. And actually that's a good way of also running a business because it causes you to be agile and adapt to a situation, especially if you've got rebounding markets. I think the second thing I found um, will be here to stay is the focus on sustainability. So the ESG agenda, I think, in both the industries I'm involved with has become just so important and, in fact, no longer a differentiator, but a table stake. And especially with the younger generation, it's absolutely essential. So again, in Burberry, we've just announced that we're going to be in an industry leading position by saying we're going to be climate positive by 2040. So we've increased significantly the level of ambition to be ahead of the Paris Agreement. So this type of thing is going to be key for finance organisations. And you can lead a lot of this through my involvement with the Prince's Trust, for instance. You can lead a lot of this in the organisation. I think the third change is risk management. And risk in some organisations is still not fully embraced um, mm -hmm. because it can see, seem to be a negative thought process rather than a positive thought process, but actually... This has taught everyone, I think, that risk assessments and risk management is essential. And then finally, digital. I mean, the pandemic 
did in three months what would have previously taken three years. I mean, working from home, yeah. connectivity, you know, reaching out to consumers and, and selling digitally, which previously was a small part of Bibris business, but now it's a major part of Bibris business. And also, I think the digital enablement of science as well and medicine, you know, again, Russia at the forefront of this by using digital tools to understand the best pathway for a patient for the for an oncology treatment. So I think it's a lot of change has come about through the pandemic, some difficult for society as a whole, but some I think will be beneficial in the longer term. Really helpful. Julie, what advice would you give to prospective non-executive candidates as they look at their first non-executive directorship, particularly to CFOs? I would, first of all, use the same advice Olivier gave to me. I think if, if you are a CFO and you're looking to broaden into being a non-exec, I would say choose carefully. There were a number of opportunities that came my way before the Roche one. Yeah. And had I taken them, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to join the Roche board. So, which has probably been one of the best things I've done without a doubt. So. I would say definitely choose carefully and take take some time over choosing the right company. Make the right contacts with headhunters and such like so that they understand what you're looking for. I think the second thing is I would I would always choose a company where the purpose is meaningful. Um, as we mentioned, it gives you that North Star. It makes it very, very powerful. So again, choose something that really you're interested in and it resonates. And, and also, I think, choose a company that you can learn from. So I find, in fact, my team sometimes dread me coming back from Roche because <laughs> I come back with lots of lots of new ideas and they say, oh, Julie's going to Roche again. Uh, so I think it's also great if you are, um, you know, working with a company that can you can learn a lot from. So something that you're passionate about and something which you can have fun with. Yes. Julie, I've got one final question for you. Um, what advice would you give the younger Julie Brown? Um, you sometimes wish you could live your life backwards, don't you? But I think in terms of advice, I would say alignment of values and culture. So wherever you join, ensure that that, that is in place. I think it's really, really important. And it means that you can be yourself and it means you will thrive never join a business where you've got to kind of mold yourself into something that you're not. I think the second thing is believe in yourself. I think the, the imposter syndrome is very easy to come by. And I think, but your mind has a very powerful impact on what you actually achieve. And if you feel you're going to be successful and believe you're going to be successful, most, most likely you will be. So I think, think positively about what you're doing. The third thing I think is be brave, take opportunities. I mean, I was given some great opportunities in AstraZeneca to be head of Latin America, to move out of finance and do yeah. a commercial, commercial role. And um, that was, again, one of the best things I did, although it was risky. I moved two levels down in the organization to do it. Um, it was actually a great broadening experience that stood me in fantastic stead as I've gone on to, to do other roles. And then finally, I think, is the importance of people. So I think sometimes, particularly in technical areas, you can get sucked into the technicalities of what you're doing or the objective. And my learning has been that no matter what level you are in an organization, people actually determine your success. And your team in particular, people who succeed, it's usually the team. You know, it's leadership, but it's also a very, very, very strong team. So recruiting the best people, making them feel energized, understanding where they're going, making them feel valued makes an incredible difference. Fantastic. Well, on those very good bits of advice um, and with a very big thank you from us. Thank you for being part of this um, series and, uh, and we wish you the best of luck at both Burberry and Roche. Many thanks, Julie. Thank you.